Over seven and a half billion people in the world. Over three billion of those people are classified as unreached. They have little or no access to the gospel. Over 41% of the population. They say of those unreached, those three billion, four out of five have never even heard the name of Jesus. Think about that for just a moment. Of that three billion people who are unreached, who have little or no access to the gospel, 80% of them haven't even heard the name of Jesus. Now think for a moment if that were your son, your daughter, your grandson, your granddaughter, your husband, your wife, your mother, your father, who had never heard the name of Jesus who had never heard about the one who can give us a hope and a future. What would you be willing to do if it was someone you loved? Let's take it a little bit further. Where would you be willing to go if it was someone you loved? Let's take it a little further. What would you be willing to give if it were someone that you loved? In light of the fact that every one of us here who are Christ followers have been called to go into the world and make disciples. In light of the fact that the Bible says that we will see power when God's Spirit comes upon us. And we will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. What are you willing to do? Because Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Master, has told us to go. For the last three weeks, we've been talking about some things that, that I, I've told you that I believe God has laid on my heart. Some things that, that I believe with all my heart, God wants us to do, God wants us to accomplish as a church. We started off by looking at that passage where Jesus is telling a story and he ends it up by saying, I want my house full. And we told how God's desire, God's wish is that the churches that teach the Bible, that proclaim the gospel, are filled with people who are seeking after Him. And we shared with you how God has laid on my heart that, that at our two campuses by the end of this year, we will have over 1,800 in worship each and every week. Now, that's a big goal. That's several hundred more than we're already having today. Several hundred more. But on that Sunday, 200 families, 200 families committed to interact with people who are unchurched. Intercede for them. Invite them to church and then invest in their lives. That's amazing. That's a praise the Lord. Last week, we... we zeroed in a little deeper to what the Bible says, and we asked the question, who is going to be your one? Because God has called each and every one of us to be a part of sharing the good news, sharing the gospel with people who are far from God. And I ask you to make a commitment to share with at least one and see them saved and baptized by the end of this year. Our plan, our desire, our goal is that we would see over 250 people baptized over the next 10 months. Well, last week, 115 of you committed to share the gospel and see at least one person come to faith and be baptized by the end of this year. That's a praise the Lord. But let me tell you, today we're going to go a little deeper. And we're going to move from what you and I can do individually to what we can do as a church family. We're going to move from talking about taking the message to our neighbors to taking the message to the nations. Because God has called each and every one of us to be a part of His great commission to go into the world. Beginning in Jerusalem, going to Judea, Judea Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And for us to learn how to do that, I want us to look at a church today that I believe is the very first intentionally missional church in the Bible. Now, it wasn't the first missional church because there were churches where people were sent out, but those churches sent people out because they had to go out. There was a persecution and the people had to leave their towns. And as they left their towns, they became missionaries. 
But today I want us to look at a church that made a decision. They decided we are going to send people into the world to reach the world. And so if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11, and then we're going to look at Acts chapter 13. So Acts chapter 11 and Acts chapter 13. Now in Acts chapter 11, we're going to begin to look at the church at Antioch. And let me give you a little bit of background. When this persecution came upon the church in Jerusalem and and the believers were scattered all around the known world, one of the places they ended up was Antioch. Antioch was a city 300 miles north of Jerusalem. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire behind Rome and Alexander. Alexandria. There were between 200,000 and 500,000 people in Antioch. It was a very wealthy city. The main street was four miles wide and it was paved with marble. There were colonnades on both sides of the street for four miles. This was a wealthy city. But it was also a wicked city. Many historians tell us that it was the second most wicked city in the Roman Empire next to Corinth. But when believers were scattered all over the known world because of the persecution in Jerusalem, the believers who ended up in Antioch did what came naturally. They began to share their faith. They began to share Jesus with the people they came in contact with. And why wouldn't we do that? I mean, if we really do believe that Jesus is the only answer to the problems of the world. If we really do believe that Jesus is the only way that we can experience eternal life with God, if we really believe that and we have experienced that, wouldn't we share that? And so these believers, wherever they went, they began to share. And those that ended up in Antioch began to share their faith. The Bible says they shared first with the Jews and then with everyone. They shared with everyone. You see, many of us today, we want to share with people who are like us. People who are in our demographic. And so if if that was me, that means that I would want to be sharing with people who are in their 50s. I know you don't believe that. But I would want to be sharing with people in their 50s who are white, who who are middle class people. We share with people who are like us. But the Bible doesn't tell us to do that. The Bible tells us that we need to share with anyone. We need to share with everyone. And that's what this church did. They shared with the poor. They shared with the rich. They shared with those of different nationalities, different ethnicities. They were sharing with everyone. And the church began to grow. By the way, our vision statement says this. We envision a church sharing the gospel of Jesus, reaching people at every age and stage of life, from every race, every nationality, and every socioeconomic background. That's the church that Jesus wants. That's the church that God wants us to build. God wants us to build a church and grow a church where there are people of every race, Every nationality, every socioeconomic background, there are young and there are old. There are people from all over the spectrum gathered together to worship Jesus. And so they had this church. They were different. They were diverse. And yet they were united in their love, their passion, and their commitment to Jesus Christ. Well, when the church in Jerusalem heard what was going on in Antioch, they sent Barnabas to check it out, to figure out what was going on. And when Barnabas got there, the Bible says he was amazed. And he encouraged them to continue doing what they were doing. Now, what were they doing? They were telling people about Jesus. And Barnabas said, keep doing what you're doing. It's working. And the Bible says that the Lord continued to add people To the church. The Bible says this in some translations the power of God was upon them. The literal translation of that verse is God's hand was upon them. In other words, it wasn't the people in Antioch that were providing the results, it was God. You see, when we do what we can do, 
When we do what God has called us to do, then God will do what only He can do. Paul said it like this. He said, Apollos planted, I watered, but it's God who gives the increase. You see, we do the work that God's called us to do. Share the gospel faithfully, committed, like He's told us to. And when we do that, God will intervene and His hand will be upon us and His hand will work through us and we will see supernatural things take place. So the church continued to grow. Well, Barnabas left Antioch for a season. He went to Tarsus to get Saul. We know him as Paul, but to bring Saul back to Antioch with him. Paul had been a Christian for about three years and And it was obvious he was a very gifted man. So Paul came back to Antioch with Barnabas. And the Bible says that Barnabas and Paul began to teach them for an entire year. They were discipled. Now understand, you don't get discipled by taking a six-week class. You get discipled by connecting with people. Getting in a group. Doing life together. And that's what Paul and Barnabas were doing. They were gathering together with these people, teaching them the truths of God. And then these people were putting these truths into practice in their life. To the point that the verse goes on and it says that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. It was in Antioch that that these disciples, these followers of Jesus were first called Christians. Those who were like Christ. Let me ask you a question for just a moment. When people talk about you, when people describe you, how do they describe you? The people you work with, the people you hang out with, the people you live next to, how do they describe you? Are you so in love with Jesus? Are you so devoted to Jesus? Do you talk about Jesus so much that when they describe you, they say, man, that man, that woman is like Jesus. They're like Christ. That's what was happening to the church in Antioch. The community, the city was wa- were watching these disciples and they said, these people so believe in this person that they're talking about that they are just like him. Their lives were changed to the point that when this church, that was a brand new church, had only been established for a couple of years, had heard about a need in Judea, a famine had come on the land, and the people were already being persecuted. They took up an offering. The Bible says everyone gave as much as they could. They gave sacrificially. They took up an offering and sent it to the believers in Judea so that they could help them in their time of need. So this was the church in Antioch. I mean, it was a church that was sharing the gospel. It was a church that was growing deep in the things of God, being discipled. A church that was living in community. A church that was giving of their resources. But then God decided he was going to do something else. He was going to take them further than they had been taken before. And he was going to take them further than he had taken any other church in the past. He was going to make them into a great church. Commission church. The kind of church that that God wants each and every one of us to be. And so I want you to listen to what it says in in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. We're going to pick up this story of all the things that were happening in Antioch. The book of Acts kind of takes a detour in chapter 12, but then in chapter 13 it goes back to Antioch. And it says this, among the prophets and teachers of the church in Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manian, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I've called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them, sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. Now there are three things we see in those four verses that I believe describe a great commission church. A great commission believer. And so if your desire is for us to be a great commission 
church, if, if you really do want to be obedient and be a great commission Christian, then these are three things that need to be found in your life. Let me give them to you. Here's truth number one. Missions flows out of genuine worship. Let me say it again. Missions always flows out of genuine worship. Look at verse 2. One day these men were worshiping the Lord. Now here's the thing. When most of us hear that phrase worship, our mind immediately goes to singing, right? We have a worship leader that leads us in singing. We sing praise and worship songs. We have time in our service where we worship and then we have time where we teach. And so oftentimes when we think about worship, we naturally think about singing. But what you need to understand is that this word worship has nothing to do with singing. Now some of you men are going, praise Jesus. I don't like to sing anyway. But you need to understand that there's other passages in the scripture that clearly command us as followers of Jesus to sing unto the Lord. So you're not off the hook. Even if you can't sing on key, the Bible tells us to sing, to make a joyful noise. So we're called to sing, but that's not what this word means. The Greek word here is liturgio. It's the word that we get our English word liturgy from. Now today, here's what liturgy means. Literally, liturgy literally means the order of public worship. And so whether it is a Catholic church or whether it's an Episcopal church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church, a Baptist church, an Assembly of God church, a uh, go-crazy church, every church has a liturgy. They have some order that they're going through in public worship. So that's what liturgy means today, but that's not what this word means. The word liturgy literally means service. Or ministry. It comes from two Greek words. It's a compound word. It comes from two Greek words. People and work. And so the word literally means the work of the people. And so worship is the work or the service of the people. You see the Bible says our worship is spiritual service. Our worship is our spiritual spiritual work. Robert Weber wrote a book on worship, and in that book, he reminded us that the word worship is a verb. It's an activity. It's not something we experience. It's something we do. You see, most often when we think about worship, we think about an experience. We go to Winter Jam, and, and we love the worship, and we have an experience. For some of you who are older, you go and you hear the Gaithers and you like it and you have an experience. But this isn't about an experience. This is about doing something. Worship is doing something. Warren Wearsby said this. He said, worship is the believer's response with all that he is, his mind, his emotions, and his body, to all that God is, says, and does. So worship is our response to God. Now this word liturgio, it's only found three times in the New Testament. It's found in Romans 15. And in that passage in Romans 15, it's used to describe an offering that the believers gave. And so worship was giving. It is found in Hebrews chapter 10 to describe the Old Testament priest who made sacrifices before God on behalf of the people. And then it is used here. Now when you read the passage here and you unpack the passage, it is clear that the worship here refers to fasting and praying. So the worship they're talking about isn't singing, it isn't dancing, it isn't raising the hands, it's not even giving here, it's fasting and praying. You see, the Bible teaches that fasting and praying is an act of worship. And it's a powerful act of worship. The truth of the matter is, if we want God to move, we've got to be a people who are involved in prayer 
and fasting. There are some things that God will not do apart from prayer and fasting. In the story of the transfiguration, when Jesus and his disciples come down off of the mountain, he finds his disciples down at the bottom of the mountain, and there's this boy that was possessed by a demon that they could not cast out the demon. Jesus came and he cast out the demon, and later on the disciples were with Jesus and said, Jesus, why weren't we able to cast out this demon? You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, because some things will only happen through prayer and fasting. Did you hear that? There are some things that are never going to be accomplished except through prayer and fasting. And so do you need a spiritual breakthrough? Do you find yourself in spiritual bondage? Do you feel like that you are kind of um, stuck? In your spiritual life? Do you want to be more missional in your life? Then what I would say to you today is this. You need to pray and you need to fast. Because there are some things God is only going to do through prayer and fasting. It was as the church had gathered together, were praying together, were fasting together, that the Holy Spirit spoke and said, set apart Paul and Barnabas. By the way, that's why house of prayer is so stinking important. It's not just a service that we do on Wednesday so that the adults who aren't in Awana or aren't with students can have a place to go. House of prayer on Wednesday is the most important service of the week for our church. It's the most important. If we believe this passage, that it is through prayer and fasting that God speaks, that God moves, that God does, then it is important for us as a body to come together to pray and to fast. And by the way, these weren't seven people praying in different places. This was the people of God gathered together in the place of God together and God spoke to them. You see, house of prayer is the cord that connects us to the power source, God. And so if we want a spiritual breakthrough, if we want to see people delivered, people healed, people saved, if we want to see missionaries raised up out of our church, then we've got to gather together in house of prayer. We've got to make that a priority. And I know, I know, some of you work to 6 o'clock, you can't be here. I understand that. Some of you, your work schedule will not allow. Some of you are helping with a one or helping with students, and praise God for that. But listen to me. If you're a part of the Northside family and you're not at work, you need to make house of prayer a priority. Because I'm telling you, when we become a praying people, God will work in our midst. It is through worship, which involves prayer and fasting, that God moves. We see that in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah was in the temple of God. He was mourning the death of the king. And it was in the temple of God, in a time of worship, that God spoke to him. God cleansed him. God saved him. And then Isaiah heard the voice of God. God said, who will go for me? Who can I send? And it was in that moment of worship in the temple that Isaiah said, Here I am, send me. Missions is the overflow of worship. Second thing, missions is sacrificial. So the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for this work of which I've called them. Now, what's important for us to understand is the church didn't just send anyone. They sent their best. Paul and Barnabas were the A team. They were the people who were protected against free agency. They were the people that that if they leave, we don't know what we're going to do. This was the best teachers. This was the best leaders that the church had. And God said, hey, I want Paul and Barnabas to go do this work. And the church didn't say, oh, wait, time out, God. 
They're our best. They're our finest. They're our most gifted. They said, okay. We're going to lay hands on them. We're going to set them apart. And we're going to send them out. And that's what they did. And so the question for us this morning is this. Are we willing to give our best? Are we willing to sacrifice to see the mission of God happen? Are we willing? I want to read to you another part of our vision statement. We envision a church of reproducing believers birthing new campuses and churches leading thousands of people to faith in Jesus. We envision a church that's birthing campuses and and churches all around. We envision a church sending hundreds of career missionaries, thousands of volunteer missionaries all over the world, empowering every member to be a missionary. We envision a church giving 30% of their receipts to reach our community, our country, and our world. 30% of everything we get in, we want to one day put that back outside our doors to reach our community, to reach our country, to reach our world. But if we're going to ever do that, if we're going to ever send out hundreds of career missionaries, it is going to cause us to sacrifice Because we're going to be giving above and beyond of our money and our resources and our people. You see, missions involves sacrifice. So let me ask you a question. What are you willing to sacrifice? I I mean, if the three billion people who are in unreached areas of the world are important to God, they should be important to us. And if they're important to us, the question we must ask is, what are we willing to give up? Am I willing to give up myself and go? Am I willing to begin to use the raises that I receive to give more money and and reach more people than increase my standard of living? Am I willing to pray that that God, if it be His will, would send my children overseas or, or to unreached areas? Am I willing to pray that for my grandchildren? Missions involve sacrifice. But then third, missions is personal. Missions involves each and every one of us putting our yes on the table and saying, whatever you ask God, I will do. Wherever you lead God, I will go. Whatever God, I am yours. If we're going to be a great commission church, it's going to require each and every one of us to personally ask God, God, what is it you want me to do? Now, I want to bring this home to what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. When you came in this morning, you received one of these cards. It's the commitment card to what we want to do in missions. And there's four parts to this card. First of all is the prayer part. I, I really don't understand why any of us would be unwilling to pray for lost people by name pray for our mission partners, to pray for the unchurched. We should make that a commitment. That's something we can all do. But I would go further than that because I'm afraid some of us just say these quick prayers when we're driving to work. We say this quick prayer when we're nodding off to sleep at night rather than really pleading before the throne of God. And so I would ask you, would you help us become the kind of church that is known as a house of prayer? A place where prayer and fasting is vital to the heart of God. Second, would you give? Now here's the thing. If you're not a part of the Northside family, if you're a guest today, tune out what I'm saying right now. Okay, just tune it out. But if you consider Northside your spiritual home, even if you haven't joined, and you don't give, then what I want to challenge you to do this morning is begin giving. Don't give to missions, just give. Just give. If you're not giving, start. Start somewhere. You say, where should I start? I'm just telling you to start. Start. Second, if you're part of the Northside family and you're giving but you're not tithing, start giving obediently. 
The tithe is not the finish line of Christian giving. The tithe is the starting line of Christian giving. The Bible teaches grace giving, which goes above and beyond the tithe. And so if you're already giving, I would challenge you, start tithing. Here's what I can tell you. I can, I can only tell you what the Bible says, and the Bible commands tithing. And I can tell you what I've experienced. Here's what I've experienced. From the very first moment my wife and I have been married, we've been sacrificial givers. Everything that we've had, we held in our hands like this and said, it's yours, God. Whenever you want it, whatever we have is yours. And that's not the tithe. That was an automatic. It was the above and beyond. And there are times that we have completely depleted all the resources we had on hand because we felt like God told us to. There were times that we sold things because we felt like God told us to. And what I can tell you is this. When we've lived that way, we haven't lived in poverty. I'm just telling you that when we've lived that way, God has just always put more and more and more in our hands. And the reason I think that he's done that is because he said, I can trust them. I can put stuff in their hands and they will be used as a conduit to give to my mission, my vision, my heart. And he's done that. And I would challenge you, if you're not tithing, start tithing. If you are tithing, then I would challenge you to give to our missions offering. Give above and beyond what you're tithing to our missions offering to reach the nations. Our budget, we have money that goes to reach the nations, but we have a missions offering that goes above and beyond that. Things that are helping us do things like to send a missionary to reach the Iban people, to plant churches in the northeast part of the United States, to, to minister to, to various needs in our community, to various partners that we have. And so begin to give sacrificially and generously give. Third thing I've challenged you to do is care. You can't really be on mission unless you care for people. And, and on this card, the crazy thing is, you will find a multitude of ways that you can care right here. In two weeks, we have food from the heart. We're going to collect over 100,000 pounds of food in one day. You can help and you'll be caring. We've got a ministry called Mission Columbia that gives away food and clothes and talks to people about Jesus. You can volunteer there. You can do that. We've got partnerships with Connie Maxwell and, and ministries that help with young ladies who are involved in, in sex trafficking. All kinds of things that you can get involved in. You can care. But then third, share. Go. Make a commitment. Now I'm going to wrap this up and tell you two things that are on my heart. Part of this Mission 2020 thing that I really do believe that God has laid on my heart. So I want you to hear them. Here's the first thing. I believe with all my heart, God wants us to have someone on the ground partnering to reach the Ivan people by the end of this year. We have the money. We have the resources. We're praying that God will raise up the people. Second, I believe that God wants us to plant a church in a sin city in the northeastern part of the United States by the end of this year. We may do that as a church family by ourselves. We may do it with another church. We may find a church planner that we partner with. But the northeastern part of the United States is one of the most, most unchurched Areas of our nation as far as evangelical Christianity is concerned. There is a need for Bible teaching churches. And so we want to have someone on the ground to reach the Iban people. We want to have planted a church in the northeastern part of the United States by the end of this year. And then third, this is the big one. Oh my, this is the big one. I believe by the end of this year, God wants at least 10 people to answer the call to serve. Not to go on a 
one week or a two week trip. No, 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 no. I, I believe over the next 10 months, God is wanting to call at least 10 people who will say, here I am. Send me. It may be to plant a church. It may be to be a part of a team that plants a church or plants a campus. It may be someone who goes overseas as a missionary using the skills and the vocation and the abilities that God has given you. But I believe with all my heart, I believe God is saying it's your time. It's time to challenge the church. And we need to step to the plate and we need to say, here I am, send me. Now, some of you are saying, well, what if I'm called? What's my next step? Well, we'll help you with that. We won't leave you on your own. Some of you are thinking, does that mean that I have to quit my job? Not necessarily. Does that mean that I have to move? Not necessarily. But what it means is that for a long time, or maybe in the next 10 months, you're going to know deep down in your heart, like the two we heard from earlier, That God's calling you. He's not calling you to sit where you're at and serve in our church. He's calling you to be sent out to reach the nation and to reach the nations. So here's what I want you to do this morning. Some of you, you're ready to make your commitment on that commitment card. If you are, that's great. But many of you aren't because we put a lot on you here, right? Right? And so if you're not ready, that's okay. You take that card home, you pray about it, you pray about it with your family, and then bring it back next week and and put your yes on the table, whatever it is with God. But here's the thing. If you want to walk in obedience, you're going to say, here I am. Send me if you're calling. And if God starts calling, let us help you know what your next step is. Bow your head. If you head bow with your eyes closed. Pray with me this morning that we'll be this missional church. Lord God Almighty, as we come into our altar time, I pray you'll have your way in each and every one of our hearts. Lord God, I pray that you'll set people free because, Lord, I know with all my heart there are people here today who are in bondage. There are some that have spiritual strongholds in their life. And, Lord God, I pray that you will set them free. Lord, there are some who are sick in need of healing, and you are the great physician, and I pray that you will heal them. Lord, there are some who are in a relationship that is going nowhere, and I pray that you'll restore it. Lord, there's some who are lost. They know it. They don't know you. They may know about you. They may know who you are, but they don't know you. And Lord, I pray today they'll come to know you. How much you love them. And then, Lord God, I believe there are some that that are being called even right now, this very minute. They don't need to wait a month or ten months. Lord, they know God's called me. I haven't responded. What do I need to do? Lord, I pray that you'll give them the courage to even this morning to step out and make that clear. And, Lord God, I pray that as we flood this altar praying for lost people by name, that you'll hear our prayers. You'll set captives free. And I pray this in Jesus' name.